Today, Joe and I are thrilled to be joined by a Nashville local, a passionate forward-thinking cannabis entrepreneur carving out a new subject matter niche in the hemp industry, co-founding and operating a Tennessee-based company focused on delivering fully customized botanical-based products for product creators and medical practitioners. Uh, with a high focus on bridging the gap between extraction labs and product manufacturers, today we are happy to welcome co-founder of Volunteer Botanicals, Jason Pickle. Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Chad. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the time. You bet. So kicking this off, from my understanding, you came into the industry after years of real estate experience, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm a Tennessee native, born and raised in Memphis, uh, went to school in Murfreesboro. Uh, graduated, spent a few years in the nonprofit field doing some fundraising for abused kids. And I decided to, as all my friends got married, to move out west. And uh, <laughs> in that move out west, I moved to Northern California, I lived in Lake Tahoe. And uh, that really was the, the paradigm shift for me. Um, growing up in a state like Tennessee when I was a kid, uh, marijuana and hemp weren't even a discussion. There was something that was really evil and bad. Um, so when I moved out to California, I truly got a firsthand experience uh, with people that I knew and met that were using cannabis in a way that they didn't understand that it could be used. Um, 10, 12 years there, I experienced many different growth setups, met a lot of people that were working in specific niches within the industry. And it, it really, it blew me away that such a mis misconception about this plan, the power of the plant. And uh, shortly thereafter, moved to Colorado, spent a few years there. Um, also cultivated in both states. So I had firsthand experience of putting my hands on the plant. And uh, that whole time I was working in real estate, but I knew as soon as I could get out and jump ship, I would. And that's what brought us to Tennessee to start volunteer botanicals. That's great. What, what initially lit that flame to kind of get your hands in the dirt and and start the farming and cultivate. You know, the I'm a, I grew up a plant person. Uh, my parents gardened, uh, my grandparents gardened. I always had fresh food on the table and it was one of those things that was just, it wasn't anything new, right? It was just another plant. It was just another herb. And uh, when living in Northern California, uh, you know, it's, it's wine and cannabis country in Northern California. And um, they took the stigma away and it was no fear. It was a free thinking place to be where people encouraged discussion, communication, uh, the, all of the stores, the, you know, the hardware stores, helps you find the right equipment. It was, it, it was just kind of this whole thing of, oh man, why, why are we afraid of this plant? And it was so a natural progression for me is to continue to grow my large plots of vegetables and I had farm animals was to put a cannabis plot out. And I only had 15 plants. That was my first real go at it. And from then I just, I fell in love with the plant and, and what the plant really truly could offer us. And I felt a passion to tell the story and tell the truth that's just been misrepresented for a long, long time. For sure. Yeah. And I can only imagine moving from West coast and like you said, Humboldt County, Northern California, everything up in the golden triangle up there is, is very synonymous for, you know, relinquishing that stigma, showcasing back medical claims, you know, providing sound structure around what marijuana and cannabis as a whole can and can't do. Um, you know, how have you seen, the iteration from transitioning from California to Colorado to back to Tennessee, I'd imagine you're faced with a lot more stigma and, you know, the advocacy that you're exuding probably has to be quite a bit more. It's, and that's, that's the case, right? Uh, I think we all know who live and work in the state of Tennessee or even in the South in general, uh, we still have a long way to go with perception and understanding. And, um, you know, it was, I didn't think it would be as difficult as it is. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I knew that uh, Tennessee's hemp program was up and running. They were making very uh, proactive changes in their policies to make it very um, smart for hemp to be farmed in the state. Uh, it seemed like everything was lining up perfectly to take what I knew, some of the contacts that I had built, um, some of the things that I had learned and integrate them back into the state here where I was born and raised. Tennessee's an ag heavy state. And I knew for a fact that if we could just understand and move past the misconception that this could be a true leader in the production of cannabis, both on the marijuana and hemp side. Um, and, you know, on, from a personal standpoint, I would have thought being gone for over 15 years that we might have looked at the plan a little bit differently. And uh, mm -hmm. I, we still have a long way to go. Um, I think what's leading the way is our hemp program. Uh, our hemp pr program is 
is really, uh, it, it's been built in a way that's telling the story in, in a very positive light. The rules are very positive from farmers and extractors. And that's allowed us to break the paradigm down a little bit. And we're beginning to see that and understand there are a lot of people now working in, 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 the, in the industry in the state. And uh, the stories are now, there's a lot more positive stories than there are negative. So we have come a long way, but we're no, nowhere near the Colorados um, or the Californias, but we're moving quickly, you know, and I think Kemp is paving that way for us. Absolutely. And in a lot of the conversations that I've had with a lot of our um, special guests that we've had here with the Tennessee Growers Coalition it has been resounding around the aspect that, you know, there's still so much work to do. And a lot of places have had that leg up or had, you know, a longer starting point than Tennessee, anywhere that really is on the East Coast. Um, and to do that, it really is expediting and translating knowledge into the industry and into your local region or state. You know, I kind of want to bring in Joe here because Joe has been a strong advocate in terms of regulatory compliance, legislation, and has really been carrying that baton forward with the Tennessee Growers Coalition. Joe, you know, what would you say the resounding culture and feel is in terms of legislation and the education that goes around that legislation for people like Jason when they come back and say, okay, we're ready to start this. We're ready to join the, you know, the front lines and the army of combating and advocacy. What does that look like for someone to come in and actually get their hands dirty and, and their feet wet, so to speak? Well, yeah, it, it was it was a pretty uh, uphill uh, struggle at first, uh, but you know what we are finding is is that uh, hemp, particularly, I mean, there's still a lot of resistance uh, on marijuana, uh, but that by and large, ninety percent or more of the Republicans uh, are supporting us in this, and of course, you know, we have super majorities uh, in both houses uh, of of the Tennessee General Assembly, so you know, really sort of. I think it's been surprising uh, to law enforcement and and other and you know just sort of some of the entrenched groups uh, against it uh, how much hemp has actually been embraced. So you know I, I think um, as as far as marijuana is concerned, I think that uh, you know the state is really not going to move at all until there's federal action decriminalizing uh, or or rescheduling. Uh, marijuana uh, to, to a more reasonable level. So, you know, I, I don't, um, but in terms of, um, you know, uh, the other thing that's been great is we've had a Tennessee department, you know, we have the Tennessee Department of Agriculture that's been very supportive. Uh, you know, it, it, again, it was a little bit uphill there at first, but once they bought in, they fully bought in, uh, and that was under Commissioner and now uh, Senator-elect Jay Templeton, uh, in the Haslam administration, and then we moved to uh, the, the Lee administration and uh, Ch Commissioner Hatcher. So it's been uh, Commissioner Hatcher's been particularly helpful, uh, and and you know the state has bought the uh, mass spectrometer uh, and all these things to do the testing that we need to do, uh, and and you know what what I think, and and, and this sort of uh, goes back to Jason and and what he's doing uh, is that. Uh, these the mass spectrometer needs needs to have resources allocated for for product safety and 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 and, and uh, you know uh, accuracy in 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 labeling and things like that where you know we can start pulling uh, products off the shelf that are either contaminated or don't uh, say accurately represent what's in it and so on and so forth so you know I think that this uh, but but you know my question for uh, for Jason would be. You know, um, there are a lot of states that are now, and uh, we discussed this a little bit uh, off camera, uh, that are putting in some really, really stringent regulations. And the, the Growers Coalition representing farmers, you know, wants to see as many products and, and as high concentration of cannabinoids in products that are safe. So, you know, rather than saying, just putting on an arbitrary cap of, well, you can't have more than 25 milligrams of total cannabinoids in uh, these gummies or, you know, something like that. Uh, so, so I'd like to get your perspective on that, Jason, and, and, and how uh, that contrasts how, how some states might be damaging uh, the hemp industry and hemp farmers as juxtaposed with what we're doing here in Tennessee. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head, Joe. I mean, one of the things that I 
really give kudos to you and the Tennessee Growers Coalition is, is the advocacy fight. Um, I think there's a lot of people in different states that are making laws for different reasons. Uh, with the industry being so new, uh, a lot of the regulators and lawmakers don't truly understand this hemp plant or how to manufacture products or the safety levels, efficacy. Should we be afraid because somebody smokes hemp that doesn't get them high? Um, you know, and there's so many questions that people are, are wondering now because there isn't a lot of, of federal legislation about these. So each state is handling them in their own way. And it's causing a lot of confusion, you know, for as far as I'm concerned, uh, a well-grown hemp plant is no different than any other medicinal herb on the planet. And there are people smoke all sorts of herbs. Um, I would say that people smoking a well-grown hemp plant probably are getting far less toxins in their body than they are just smoking a cigarette that you can legally buy. And so there's some strange irony, I think, that's going on. And having states handle them one at a time, there's a lot of pros and cons to that. Uh, we want states to be able to, to get their hands dirty and make decisions but we're also seeing that some of these decisions are counterproductive and, uh, and there needs to be some regulation. Uh, from our side of things, we work in, in a very different niche of the industry and, and we're converting a lot of these extracts to different mediums. So we're hoping that just through our business, which we'll get into here in a minute, that we can open up a new perspective to how cannabinoids can be viewed and looked at. Uh, we believe that they're ingredients. They're, they're just the same as an ingredient as any other nutraceutical that you would put into a capsule or put into a food or beverage. Um, but that's not the way everybody's looking at it right now. So I still think that there needs to be um, some more education. It's gonna take a few more years to shake out. Um, I, I agree with Joe, federal legalization and these sorts of things are gonna allow us to kind of communicate with other states that maybe are doing it better uh, and, and help other states that aren't doing it as well. And it's gonna take us all continuing to work on it. The work's done behind the scenes. The work's really, I mean, this takes a village. And if it isn't for groups like the Tennessee Cro G Growers Coalition, our Department of Ag working lockstep together, uh, everybody's just kind of doing it themselves and nothing ever really gets done. And there's a lot of states that that's happening in and, uh, I'm proud of Tennessee that we have such active and proactive groups that are, are trying to find ways to access and use cannabinoids that are safe, effective, and reliable and trustworthy. And I think if we can get past that, we're going to open up to the other 80% of the industry that's just waiting to access cannabinoids. And not just CBD, but all of the cannabinoids that are available to us. Well, you, you do, you create water-soluble cannabinoids, uh, and, and, and CBD is obviously one. And, and as we see these regulations uh, coming in in some states, uh, you know, bioavailability becomes a big question and water soluble products, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, have extremely higher rates of uh, absorption uh, than, than, you know, just uh, straight tinctures, you know, I mean, straight uh, uh, crude and distillate. Um, You're exactly right. Yeah, You're exactly that, right. And I think that's, that's of that. yeah. And I think that's what I was, that's what I was touching on lightly is, you know, the most bioavailable form is, is to consume this thing in its rawest, purest form, which would probably be, be smoking it or vaping it realistically. That's not for everybody. So the next step down the, the line is oils. Well, our body is made of water. We're not made of oil. Um, oils do work. Um, I like oils, um, but a lot of people don't like putting a full spectrum extract under their tongue and holding it there, my parents being one of them. And so as we continue to open up to find ways of how to utilize cannabinoids, we have to look at things of uh, comfort, usability, um, delivery systems that a consumer is comfortable with, that they enjoy already, and stuff that works. You know, one, one conversation I have all the time is talking about CBD that works. There's a lot of product on the market and there's a lot of junk product because of the lack or low regulation. So our goal as a company is to, is to kind of be that bridge we work between extractors and farmers and connect them to product creators. So our conversions that we do, you mentioned water soluble, absolutely. We have a water soluble liquid that we can convert any crude distillate or isolate into or terpene, any of the plant terpenes we can work with. Um, we also have a water soluble powder that works for food and beverage applications, stick packs, protein powders, those sorts of things. So again, we're turning these cannabinoids into ingredients. And our third one is our, our truly our claim to fame is our patent pending flowable powders. 
And flowable powders, the interesting, the difference in these versus water soluble, which you hear of, of quite a bit, is uh, they're based, the root of the technology is based in the pharmaceutical world. And so what we're doing, our chief science officer, he has some intellectual property that is very intriguing. And he worked um, in the late 90s turning Imodium into a tablet form, into a powder form. So it took him about a year and a half uh, doing some R&D bench work to figure out how to turn that thick viscous liquid into something that could be turned into a tablet. Uh, he did it. We now have Imodium Advanced still on the shelf as one of the best sellers. So this technology, the root of it is what we're doing today with cannabinoids. And it works for crude, works for distillate, works for isolate, works for terpenes. So we can take these low soluble items run them through our scientific process and the throughput allows a product creator to have the exact same particle size, density, and complete content uniformity. So each particle has the amount of cannabinoids needed to you have a very precise and specific do dosing mechanism. So the interesting thing that this technology allows us to do is reconstitute. We can take a full spectrum distillate, build a flowable powder out of it, retest that powder and then reintroduce other powders that we have converted back to it to, to achieve very specific ratios or a specific design deliverable that a end user might want or a business wants to create. And it's custom, right? We, you can't do that with a crude oil. You can't do that with a distillate oil. So you touched on flowable powder or uh, water soluble, but the big picture is I think we're moving past these base level formulations and this new technology will allow new companies that maybe aren't even hemp companies to come in and be able to integrate now these ingredients into their current manufacturing practices without having to change anything. It's just yeah. another ingredient, um, just like anything else that they're using in their co-packer or their contract manufacturing system. And I believe that's the future, right? That's going to bring in people that are on the sidelines that or maybe afraid of smoking hemp, or maybe afraid of putting, don't like the taste of the tincture under their tongue, but they'll take a chewable tablet. They'll take an oral, a dissolving tablet. They'll take a capsule. So it's, you know, I think we have some, some space here still to grab. So how far are we from, um, you know, being able to assess the, the customization aspect where a person can have their genome tested and say, you know, this particular set uh, combination of cannabinoids uh, is best for this person to achieve homeostasis. How many years do you think that is uh, away? Uh, because it seems like that what you're talking about, it, it, that's where it's leading. And maybe even Absolutely. not, not only uh, is this going to be beneficial from the pharmaceutical standpoint, but from the neutral, nutraceutical standpoint as well. I'd say three to five. Uh, people think it's longer than that, but it's moving very quickly. Um, we've been in conversation with two different uh, genetics testing companies, and we feel that our technology will allow people to access their own personalized medicine routine. And you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's our philosophy is as we learn more about cannabinoids, it's not going to be just a one shot deal where whatever, you know, this is the oil. Whatever's in it is what you get and hope for the best. Throw it on the wall, see what sticks. Well, um, we're going to move back. The added proposition of this is, is, is unlimited, you know, because, you know, just two years ago, people were paying 10 cents a milligram for oil. That's right. Uh, and, and now, you know, we're seeing it at, you know, at cost at a fraction of a penny per milligram. So it seems like to me that, you know, the market was, is certainly going to allow particularly customized products to fit, go back into that five to 10 cent uh, per milligram price point that people have already uh, proven willing to spend. Yep, very well said. And I think the biggest barrier right now, at least the barrier that I've communicated to with different genetics testing and genome testing companies are the data. Uh, many of them use artificial intelligence to scrub the publications that are out there that actually have physical data behind each cannabinoid. And right now it's all focused on CBD and THC and there's a ton of data. So those that are in the industry, we all know that the medicinal value is there. The data proves it. it's all over the world. But as we get into cannabinoids like CBC and CBN and THCV and the acidic cannabinoids, which are extremely powerful, CBDA, CBGA, um, we are just scratching the surface on data. 
So it's and that's great. And, yeah. and holding that data is, is a nice thing to have, but then it comes into always on the back end, what I have always been faced with, and I'm sure probably everybody on this interview has been faced with is what the consumers are saying and what they know and what resonates with them. For our listeners out there, can you explain what some of your clients are using the flowable powders for and what is some of the initial feedback that you're receiving? Yeah, that's, and that's a great question. The flowable powders really allow us to do a couple of different things that oils can't do. The particle size on our flowable powders are so small that we can pack massive milligrams into a very, very small delivery system. Uh, for example, if you're familiar with capsule sizes, we can fit 40 to 50 megs of, of a full spectrum distillate oil once we powderize it into a size three capsule, which is basically the size of a Benadryl. Um, as we go up the line, um, we, we formulate primarily to a size one capsule. It's not much bigger than a Tylenol. So, you know, very, very small delivery and well over 100 to 115 milligrams can go into there. So as we go up, we now have the opportunity to have much higher doses, much more medical level doses, um, even though we're not there yet and the market isn't there yet. Um, so that's one example. Second example is because the particle size is so small, it allows us to combine them with other nutraceuticals extremely well. So when you, you're starting to hear people mixing oils together for a sleep blend or a relax blend or an immunity blend using CBG, um, we're able to do that, but then also couple, of, couple that with vitamins and minerals and other nutraceuticals to make a, a more supplement, uh, a, truly a, a supplement. Um, and I think third, the, the neatest form factor that we're beginning to see people have a a lot of excitement about is, is we also press tablets. So we have three different tablet formulations, depending on what a, a deliverable or, or desired effect might be. Um, number one is an oral dissolving tablet. Little guy, it's about half the size of a Tic Tac and it melts on your tongue. So massive bioavailability, max out about 10 milligrams of cannabinoids. So it's very, very small, but very, very potent. So you don't lose it in the gut. Second is a chewable tablet. That would be a more like a vitamin, a chewable vitamin form factor. A lot of people are, are starting to shift away from gummies because they're candy and, and integrate our chewable tablets because they are fully uh, medical grade ingredients. And then the third is our um, instant release caplet. So it, it's a, a tablet that's designed to interact with the acids in the gut and become available to the body very quickly without moving through the first pass. And these form factors all of which can be customized perfectly to say 30 megs of this and 10 megs of that, um, adding terpenes back in. So there's a, a lot of flexibility here that people are, are now getting creative. You know, they're saying, mm -hmm. hey, I want I want a tablet that has a, a bunch of terpenes in it that help you to relax. And I wanted to have five megs of CBN and 30 megs of full spectrum CBD and, and some CBG. Can you do that? And the answer now is yes. Absolutely. And it sounds like a lot of your demographic and target market segment then would be dietary supplements, pharmaceutical, et cetera. Are you targeting companies outside of the hemp space in terms of trying to find and integrate these types of companies to come in and utilize the flowable powders? And again, what is some of the initial feedback that you're receiving from the manufacturers that you do showcase your products to and what their customers are saying? Great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we believe that there's still 80% on the sidelines that haven't tried cannabinoids and they're waiting for a form factor that's, that's right for them. And those are your typical, I mean, we're a pill society, let's be real. So if we can take the power of cannabinoids and tr take true extracts and make extremely potent dynamic deliverables that are in a form like that, uh, people are going to gobble it up, no pun intended. So we've spent a lot of time over the last year on the phone with co-packers, contract manufacturers, um, a bunch of pharmacies have brought us in to do presentations. Um, McKesson is another group that actually we spoke in front of not too long ago. So there's a lot of different groups that are saying, wow, you know, you can do this with cannabinoids. We had no clue. This is right up our wheelhouse, but they still have just a toe in the water, right? If they're not in the hemp space and they don't understand cannabinoids, it's still not the time to say we're going all in. But what we have seen, which we think is extremely promising, is they're, they're, folks are trying it. They're testing it. They're bringing it in. They're doing conversions. We're sending samples. They're intrigued. We're doing site visits. You know, so we're getting a lot of yeses soon. Yes, maybe. 
-hmm. we're talking about cannabinoids, but not yet. So I think we're, we're close. We really are. What do you think it takes to move forward and allow those companies uh, to take the handcuffs off, right? And openly promote the benefits of CBD that we all know, and not just CBD, but cannabinoids in general. Um, You know, again, I think a lot of it is due to legislative, regulatory, and other initiatives that are you know, frankly, road stopping people in terms of the FDA, Uh, the USDA has kind of counteracted some of their interim final rule statements in terms of helping farmers. But, you know, how do we provide solutions for those companies to take those handcuffs off? You know, it's it's the FDA. I mean, that's the reality. I think if we could have a solid framework from the FDA, uh, I think that would give most of them enough um, we, we have companies right now, we're in nine month R and D with a, with a, a, a global company and they're in 10 different countries on a very specific application of cannabinoids, very specific, very unique. And we went to R and D with them, found out a way to work. Now they're working up to figure out how to get this into their full scale production and they're not holding back. So you know, I think there's people that are all along that continuum saying on the far end, we're not touching it until the FDA gives us clear guidance to other companies that say, I don't want to miss out because we hear that this stuff is extremely potent and very effective and natural. And we want to go ahead and start bringing it in and doing our own internal research all the way to folks like right now, co-packers and contract manufacturers you know, they're not set up and they're, they're doing tinctures and gel caps, but beyond that, they don't, all their systems are set up for powders. So it, you know, they're ones that are saying, Ooh, this is, I've been waiting for this. So you can give me a consistent powder every single time, different cannabinoids, different terpenes that are going to be exactly the same every time. And those are the ones that are starting to now say, all right, let's take it in. Let's, I have some clients that are interested in CBD products that aren't oil based Um, so I think, you know, the continuum is there, but without a clear guidance and a clear roadmap for all of us to work with under, um, I think it's still going to take some time. Uh, I just think these big corporations that aren't in the hemp space don't understand cannabinoids. They don't care. They just want an effective ingredient, no matter what it is. And they're not going to do it until they get a clear path or picture on, on how to, how to advance through it. And Joe, obviously you work on a lot of local and regional regulatory legislation, et cetera. What does it look like from a domestic point of view and, you know, from a DC point of view in terms of federal oversight? We're just waiting. I I think, you know, that's, that's what's so frustrating about this. Now, you know, from a business perspective, you know, I, I, and, and this is a much maligned sec. I, I'm in a much maligned sector of our industry. I'm in smokable and I'm in distribution of potentially uh, water soluble products in convenience stores. So, you know, from a profitability perspective, I, I'm thrilled to death, but for the good of the consumer, uh, you know, these things that we need some clarity uh, from the, from the feds, and, you know, we've written a letter asking uh, President Trump, and, and this would flip to President Biden if he's elected, uh, 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 the request to, to begin to create what's called a FACA committee based, uh, based on the Federal Advisory Commission Act, which would, be, uh, which would be set up from industry experts, medical experts, uh, uh, you know, all, all members of the agricultural and scientific community to actually uh, advise the USDA, the FDA, the FTC, uh, and all these, uh, be a friend of the courts and things like that simultaneously, uh, because with, with the interference from, from law enforcement, with the interference from the pharmaceutical industry, quite frankly, I mean, as much as, you know, I want to be a friend of the marijuana industry, uh, they're trying, they're in many cases trying to shove the, the hemp industry out of the picture, like in New York, um, you know, in, in Kentucky, potentially, um, you know, we need somebody, we need a supra regulatory uh, agency, somebody that, that advises uh, Congress and, and the executive branch on policy uh, that, that can fix this, uh, that, that can settle the landscape. Yep, I agree. And, you know, looking, what I always like to do and when we're wrapping these up and having these conversations is 
it's so hard to forecast in this industry. It's so hard to say what's the industry going to look like in five years because, you know, there's so many different types of products that we can be looking at. There's so many different regulations that can roll out and we're kind of pitted behind uh, a multifaceted position in terms of government, in terms of innovation, technology advancement, and everything in between, um, with one of those being a big stigma perspective as well. So I, I asked this a little tongue in cheek, Jason, but where do you think the industry is going in 2021? And where do you think that it will head in the next two to three years? You know, I, th I think we're going to get some real exciting data that is going to come out of, of, of science-based data. And I think now that um, our country is truly, we're embracing cannabis now in whatever form it comes in. I mean, it's, it's much, much more positive of a conversation uh, than I have, even with my friends and family. So the data is, continues to come. Um, we're learning more about rare and minor cannabinoids that we mentioned before. So the discussion is shifting away from CBD and THC, which means, oh, there's more stuff in this hemp plant that I didn't know about. And yeah, there's a ton more. And we're just talking about the medicinal side of things. Forget about all of the uh, industrial side of things of what this plant can offer us. So this discussion, I think, is, it, is a positive one. It is slow going and there's hurdles along the way, but really it takes all of us. I mean, it takes Chad, it takes Joe, it takes Jason, us taking these risks and having these conversations so we can continue to help people understand that this isn't something to be afraid of. So I think as the data continues to come out, um, data about what this plan is doing for farmers, uh, for the economy, um, for tax revenue, you know, tax revenue is the big push, right? If you're making enough in taxes, all of a sudden everything can be legal. And we move right past all the, all the quote, bad information that's out there. So all of this is moving in the direction that we want. Is it going to move fast? Probably not. Um, are we going to have a sweeping legislation that federally legalizes everything? We could, uh, but then that would put in a whole other set of new roadblocks into place because a lot of those factors that you mentioned still aren't figured out yet. Um, but I see the data coming. I see the, the information and, and the development of new cannabinoids and new cannabinoid-based products that aren't just CBD. Because right now, a lot of the people that are uneducated think everything is CBD and CBD only. And our experience in the last six to eight months is, man, these minor cannabinoids or rares really have a ton to offer. So I think as we move forward into 2021, it's, it's going to be less of the same old story and more of the untapped potential of what this plant still has, has to offer that we yet to understand. And um, there aren't a whole lot of regulations around any of the other cannabinoids. So everybody's pounding the regulations on CBD and THC. But again, we see that that's almost a foolish push too. So we're learning as we go. And I think that um, we continue to tell the story, speak the truth, advocate in any way we can, do our part, support groups like the Tennessee Growers Coalition. They're actually, they're, they're where the rubber meets the road, right? All of our businesses are the ones out there. We're all doing our own little niche, trying to tell our story and impact the people that we, that we work with. But really it's a legislative issue. And, um, and I think that's the most important thing I think we need to touch on is vote. Vote for pro-cannabis people, um, understand what this plant can do, support locally, whether that's in Tennessee or in any other state, and have faith that what you're working behind is something that's very powerful and very good for humanity. And I know that in my heart, both of you know that in your heart, or we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. You bet. Absolutely. Well said. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of new issues that are coming to the docket, but for those of you that are looking into manufacturing, those of you that are on the front end with farming, cultivation and processing, reach out to Jason. They know what they're doing over there and, and we're really excited to see the success and movement forward for you guys. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, thank Chad. You, Joe. Absolutely. Appreciate y'all. You bet. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate yep, it. That was a great job. Thank you. You bet. We'll talk to you Appreciate soon. You, Chad. All right.